I'm Gary Johnson. Welcome to San Diego, California, where we're getting ready for the 1992 America's Cup. Several foreign teams have arrived here in San Diego and have set up camp in compounds like this. Now in a few minutes, I'm going to take you sailing on one of the brand new America's Cup class yachts, America Cube. And you're going to find out firsthand what it's like to sail on one of these fascinating yachts. But first, let me show you what we have in store for you in this issue. Grab your passport, because we're heading south, way south, across the equator to cruise New Zealand. We're also going to look at some new computer tools to help you with your celestial navigation. Then you better pull on your wetsuit, because we're going for a wet and wild ride on the fastest monohull sailboats in the world. Next, Don Street is back with a new tip on how to prevent accidental jibes. And lastly, Roger Marshall will review the new Beneteau 45 F5. New Zealand. Those words conjure up images of lush green hillsides dotted with sheep. And the capital of New Zealand is Auckland, nicknamed the City of Sails. In fact, the people there raised over $200,000 to keep the Russian yacht Fazizi in the Whitbread race. And of course, I'm no stranger to racing sailors from New Zealand like Michael Fay, Bruce Farr, Peter Blake, and Chris Dixon. But in the northern part of the country is a special place for cruising sailors and a stop on every circumnavigator's route. It's called the Bay of Islands. Sailing is very popular up here. They call it the Bay of Islands because there is something like 158 islands. The islands are located up towards the top of the North Island in New Zealand. The main group of islands in the Bay of Islands are covering an area of something like 10 to 20 miles inside the sheltered natural harbour of the Bay of Islands. And if you wish to go further, you can go outside Cape Brett, heading south down the coast, or head north up to Wangaroa Harbour, which is just north of the Cavalli Island. There's Robertan Island, Motoroa, Motokiki, Urupukapuka, Waiwatoria and Okahu. They are the main islands in the Bay of Islands. And each of them has a number of anchorages, so if it decides it's going to get up a little bit breezy one evening, all you have to do is pull the anchor and slip round the corner to the other bay and you've got yourself another sheltered anchorage. The islands themselves in the Bay of Islands are all tree covered, uh, pine trees, native bush, hundreds of different varieties of trees, uh, sandy beaches mainly on the inside uh, side of the islands and kelp covered rocks on the seaward side. Uh, most of the bays have a sandy bottom, good holding, good anchorages. It's a, a marvellous place because of the variety of winds we get generally in the summer just beautiful sea breezes maybe from 10 up to 20 knots and during the evening it normally settles down so apart from the occasional storm they're very sheltered very little swell and if there does happen to be any swell or adverse conditions there is always a shelter from the many different bays situated around the islands. Summertime in the Bay of Islands begins officially in November and runs through to about April or May. The temperatures during that period average between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. During the evenings it cools off quite nicely and once the sun has basically gone down, the seas drop off and you're in a beautiful, tranquil anchorage for the evening. For this five day trip we've chartered one of Rainbow Yacht Charter's uh, FAR 1220, it's a uh, 42 foot sloop rigged boat, uh, fairly light displacement, very good in light airs and we've had some great sailing with uh, the last few days, I think we've probably averaged about uh, six to seven knots, uh, the boat goes well to windward uh, and it has been a lot, of, a lot of fun to sail around the islands. The 
first day we left here, we stopped in a bay called Oki Bay for the evening, which is sheltered from the any southerly winds. A beautiful white sandy beach, clear water. The following day, we up anchor and moved around past Cape Brett, which has the hole in the rock, which is a big tourist attraction here in the Bay of Islands. There are always large schools of surface feeding fish. Uh, that always attracts the birds, so there's always an abundance of life out there. Moving round from Cape Brett down the coastline, we headed down uh, about another hour and a half sail down as the old whaling station of Wongamuma, a beautiful deep anchorage, well sheltered from most directions. Uh, a lot of history in Wongamuma itself with the whaling station or what's left of the whaling station still intact there. Wongamuma, as with many of the places here, is a Maori Indian name. Wanting to learn more about the Maoris, we headed toward Paihia for a special cultural event involving the Maoris, various other tribes, and representatives from the New Zealand government. The Maoris were the first people in New Zealand. They arrived uh, by canoe, apparently from uh, up near Hawaii many, many years ago, and settled all around uh, the North Island, New Zealand. And uh, they were here on their own, basically, up until Captain Cook and a few white people arrived and began to settle the islands. Today is quite an important day for them today. Uh, it's commemorating the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, the treaty was signed 150 years ago between the Maori chiefs of all the tribes and the Queen's representative. And the Maoris usually put on some uh, sort of displays, concert with the singing and poise and dancing. As well, they will have their war canoes, which are called walkers. Uh, some of them have, I think, up to about a, a hundred paddlers in some of the bigger ones. And that's uh, very important to the Maoris, this uh, ceremony in, in their canoes, because they have a, a strong uh, adherence to their past and traditions. Uh, it's a beautiful spot up there in the tre treaty grounds with the old treaty house. They've all been well preserved. <laughs> Grateful to have met these fellows under sociable circumstances, we headed out to Robertson Island in the company of dolphins. One of the uh, most popular and larger islands in the bay is uh, Robertson Island, or Twin Lagoons, they have in there, which uh, at high tide, these two circular lagoons fill up with water and it's very popular. Good deep water anchorage, pretty well sheltered from most directions. Uh, you can get the yacht right up within 20 feet of the beach in a quick simmer saw and then a picnic or a swim in the two lagoons. We anchored just off the end of the island and took a walk up onto the beach and along the track and just had a uh, picnic up on top of the hill there. If you want to go for a walk, there's lots of tracks just about on every island.
most of the islands you get a 360 degree view of the whole of the Bay of Islands, it's uh, quite tremendous. Everyone relaxed and refreshed from our picnic ashore, we hoisted sails and cruised to the historic town of Russell. Russell's a very interesting little town, um, lots of character to it, a lot of history, which originally was the first capital of New Zealand. There's a famous pub there in uh, Russell called the Duke of Marlborough, which is the oldest hotel in New Zealand. It's situated right on the waterfront there. Uh, it goes back to the whaling days when the whalers used to use it for a bit of uh, rest and relaxation before heading back to their hard work of catching whales at Wangamumu Harbour. The Russell Swordfish Club, uh, if you'd like to visit, has some incredible species of fish that have been caught, some world record blue marlin of 1,100 pound, and they hold quite a, a number of world records here. Because of the beautiful weather conditions here in the Bay of Islands, there's lots of other sports and pastimes uh, that can be done by tourists or the locals, particularly diving is very popular here. The water is quite clear, very clear with visibility, in the outer islands up around uh, 100 feet. It's just absolutely a great abundance of life under the water, very interesting diving. We've been out cruising for five nights now and I, uh, out of those four nights we've had uh, fresh seafood caught straight off the seafloor, off the rocks for four of those five nights and then last evening we dined on uh, rock lobster, which are excellent. It's great to do that because in a restaurant they'll, uh, you have to mortgage your house to get one so it's nice just to be able to find them under a rock and cook them up within 10 minutes of catching them. Yeah, there's nothing like uh, putting on a set of scuba gear and uh, entering the water and getting something to feed everybody for the evening meal is really marvellous, whether it's uh, scallops or crayfish, it's uh, great. Food of the gods. I think you'll notice that if you drive down through New Zealand that the majority is just all as it was when the first settlers arrived years ago. Most sailboat races either last a day or maybe a weekend or even a race week. But the America's Cup, I think, stands alone because you spend nearly a year and a half preparing for a series of races as the best four out of seven races. The next cup also stands alone because the traditional 12 meters are being retired and replaced by the new America's Cup class yacht. And in this issue, we'll look at this change and others in store for the upcoming 1992 America's Cup series. You know, you think that sailing out here in the light winds of San Diego is easy, and it is physically compared to, say, the high winds of Fremantle, but actually it is really tough because it takes a lot of concentration, and just one knot difference in wind will mean the difference between winning and losing. And these new America's Cup class boats, I think, are uh, pretty exciting. And the reason is there's a massive amount of sail area. I mean, the main is 100 feet on the hoist, the boom is over 30 feet long, and the mainsail has full-length batten, so you get a real lot of sail area here, hence a lot of power. Plus, all the stability in this boat is in a bulb at the bottom. So it's a boat with a lot of power. The boat itself is very light, with all the stability really down low. The keel hangs 14 feet below the hull, and there is 10 tons of weight concentrated in a lead bulb to supply the stability required to counterbalance the massive rig. This is the last keel you're likely to see because future modifications will be classified on all the boats. 12 meters are boats that are really heavy for their size. They weigh about 55,000 pounds, and as a result, they accelerate very slowly. It takes a lot of finesse with the sails. By contrast, these boats weigh about 15 or 18,000 pounds less than a 12 meter, and the main is almost twice as big in area, so you get a lot more acceleration. The boat feels really light and lively to sail. It's a nimble boat. It's a good thing a San Diego's light air. 
But the difference between this America's Cup and Australia is that was a lot of brute strength. Here it's going to be a lot of finesse, but it's going to take concentration and good teamwork to make it all work. We have 16 people aboard the boat. The boat is 75 feet long. And a maxi, for example, is 85 feet, only 10 feet longer, but has just about twice as many sailors. The crew in the America's Cup class yachts are really divided up into four different sections. Back here behind the wheel is what's traditionally known as the afterguard. This is the helmsman, a tactician, and then a navigator whose primary job is to look at performance. The helmsman steers, and the tactician and the navigator work the running backstays and also watch the instruments. Moving forward, you have the trimming area. In the trimming area, you have the mainsail. This is a two-person job on this boat to control a main with a 114-foot mast and a 30-foot boom. So you have really strong people that also have a lot of finesse. The trimming area is just forward. These people take care of the spinnaker and the jib. Now, the third team are the grinders. These are very strong people. We've looked into the ranks of football players, people that are used to good burst of energy. They have a lot of endurance. They turn the winches of both the mainsail and the jib. Then moving forward, you have the mast area. And these are the people that set new sails. They also back up the grinders. They pull up the spinnakers. They take down the spinnakers. So you have a sewer man, a person to pack sails down below deck, somebody working at the mast to pull sails up, two people in the pit. This is kind of the nerve center of the boat where all the halyards run and make adjustments to the sails. And then you have a bowman. The bowman is usually kind of like a ballet star or a wide receiver on a football team, a person with a lot of finesse. And the key to winning is the boat that makes the fewest mistakes. And any one sailor could blow it for all the rest. So working together as a team is really important. The cockpit is much different in America's Cup class because what you try to do is to keep the weight out of the ends. So behind me here is over 20 feet to the stern of the boat. So the 16 crew really have to work together in very close proximity. And what we did is we made a mock-up of a deck, tried all kinds of different maneuvers with fake winches to place the wheel, to place the winches, the handles, to see that we could work together and everything fit in as small as area as we could do to try and concentrate the weight. Another unique feature of this boat is the spinnaker pole, which extends about three meters or about 10 feet out past the headstay. So this allows you to have a much bigger spinnaker, which by the way goes all the way to the top of the mast, even though the jib is a fractional rig, gives you a lot of sail area and a lot of power. So you'll find that these boats will sail with the apparent wind well forward, the spinnaker pull on the headstay, and it'll generate a lot of speed when you're sailing downwind. Well, the San Diego Yacht Club has come up with a new America's Cup course that's different than we've seen in the past. And the idea is to test boats in all points of sailing. The first of eight legs is sailed 3.7 miles to windward, followed by a run. Then it's around the leeward mark at the starting line and back to windward, but this time only three miles. Then the action. A zigzag reaching leg that starts out with the wind angle at 135, 100, and 135 again before rounding the leeward mark, racing back to windward, putting a real premium on boat handling. The crews are going to be busy. On this America's Cup course, the last leg is to leeward, so the trailing boat, if he's close, may have an advantage by blocking the wind of the leading boat. So it could make for some really close finishes. Also in the upcoming America's Cup, there will be on the water judging, which is something that is totally new to cup racing. No longer will an incident be long and drawn out in a protest room. Umpires on the water will make an instant call of whether one boat fouled another boat. And if there is a foul, the race doesn't end. There's simply a 270 degree turn. So you can take your penalty and get on your way and the race continues. So I think it's a really good and important innovation for the America's Cup to have umpires on the water. And what the umpires do is they get aboard a boat called a wing boat that's off to the side. And that boat looks at things like overlaps coming into a leeward mark or master beam in a luffing type situation. Then there's a second umpire boat behind the competitors. One umpire will take one boat, the other umpire will take the other, and they'll talk through the maneuvers. So they might say, I'm on port tack. OK, I'm starting the tack now. I'm on starboard tack. And by talking through, they put themselves in the cockpit of the racing boat, and it becomes easier to make the call. 
Attacking. Attacking. Attack. We've got a chance to keep clear there. In an effort to learn how umpiring will work in the Cup, we invited several judges slated for the trials to spend a week with us. We wanted to test various situations to see how they'd make some calls. So John Kostecki and I, skippering two Catalina 37 practice boats, stage a variety of incidents. We purposely fouled each other, or called non-existent fouls, to see how the judges would react. During this exercise, three fouls were called, but were they legitimate? So we're going to call the judges alongside now, and we'll see what they have to say. So we don't think he's under any obligation to give you over room opportunity because you caused that overlap by coming down. So this and guy he gets cannot. Fired. Psh, yep. This is come you. Up hard. This no, is, well, it doesn't matter. Well, no, but who are you saying? Can this guy come up hard? Yes. <laughs> he's he's going to be in trouble here. Right. If you hit the he other got guy, himself in he initiated. Umpiring's totally new. Yeah. I think the umpires are learning from the competitors, the competitors are learning from the umpires, but the best part is it's going to make match racing and racing in America's Cup a lot better for both the sailors and also the non-sailors. Now there will be an instant call on the water, just like we have in any other sport. What remains to be seen is if we'll have more protest incidents than we've had in past America's Cups. I think with umpiring, there might be a lot more fouls, which could make it more exciting for television, because you get one boat that's a little bit slower, his only recourse is to try the other, foul the other one out. The faster boat has to take a penalty turn and is now behind and has to try and catch up. Over the last 15 years, the Cup has changed from a summertime event to a full-time endeavor. Every syndicate spends tens of millions of dollars. The sailors practice for over a year for this race. And the support team of researchers, management, and athletes numbers over 100 strong for each group. These are massive, complicated efforts with a lot of pressure to win. So next issue, we'll give you an insider's look at the defense campaign our team is mounting. A look at America Q. As you've seen, computers have moved aboard sailboats in a big way. In our next story, Jim Cook is going to demonstrate several computer programs to help you with celestial navigation at sea. Jim is a seasoned delivery skipper, and he's taught sailing and celestial navigation for many years. So if you're into computers and want to perfect or even learn about celestial navigation, you'll be interested in what he has to say. Celestial navigation has been part of the art and science of sailing for centuries. And today, even with the decreasing cost and availability of GPS and sat-nav systems, most boats still head offshore with a navigator who understands celestial navigation and is trusty sextant. More vessels are heading offshore with computers these days, and several programs have been developed to help us understand and master the techniques of celestial navigation. These three programs that we're going to review today are PC Navigator, by Pacific Marine Corporation, the Davis PC Astro Navigator, which is available as a standalone program or as a kit, including a sextant and an artificial horizon. Our third program is the J. Henry Navigational Program, which is available as a standalone program or with an optional instructional program, which teaches you the basics of celestial navigation. Each of the programs come on standard disks and each of the manuals have simple instructions for installing the programs onto your computer. You do not have to be a computer whiz to install or run any of these programs. Manually, the process from sextant to chart takes about 40 different additions and subtractions. The computer takes both the drudgery and the risk of mathematical error out of this process. It makes celestial navigation a whole lot more fun and a whole lot easier to understand. The information we're using to demonstrate these three programs is from a trip we took from the Chesapeake to the Virgin Islands last fall. Our first program is going to be PC Navigator. 
with all of the programs, we must first initialize the data that is going to remain the same for the trip. It asks us for our original latitude and longitude, the Chesapeake, our destination latitude and longitude, the Virgin Islands. The DR latitude, longitude, and Greenwich time and day are items that will have to be changed throughout the voyage. Our vessel course and speed, our set and drift, are also entered. The next set of parameters are settings for the sextant that will remain constant every time you use the sextant. Now that we've entered the initializing data, it's time to solve a site. We enter the date and time of our site. We enter the sextant reading, in our case 24 degrees 22.9 minutes. We were shooting the sun, so we use the number one and the lower limb of the sun. To solve the site, we press F2. It's done. Remember that this used to take us 40 additions and subtractions to get to the same point. In our case, our line of position is 16.3 nautical miles towards the celestial body with, a, with an azimuth of 127.8 degrees true. We've now finished with this particular shot. Throughout the day, you'll take two more shots, entering them exactly the same way. The computer will combine all three shots and give you an exact latitude and longitude. Some of the additional features in PC Navigator are several ways to solve the Great Circle Route. You'd use the Great Circle Route if you wanted the shortest distance between New York and London. If, however, you wanted to sail in a straight line, then it'll also give you the rum line calculation. It has very good piloting features, including course and speed made good, course and speed steered, true and apparent wind. In the celestial area, we have several planning features that allow you to plan your morning sights prior to getting the sextant out of the box. We've got a multi-year almanac. We have several different ways to solve different kinds of sites. There's a very quick routine for solving the noon site. This is the standard site that most navigators work with. These programs do take it a little further, solving for both latitude and longitude with one site. One of the major difficulties we have when we're using a sextant at sea is the boat rocking, you rocking, and everything bouncing around while you're, taking, while you're trying to take a site. For this reason, we usually take several sites of the same object in any one session. Personally, I usually take 10. You then have to plot them out on a piece of graph paper and come up with a sighting that you'd most likely use. Our next program, the J. Henry Navigation Program, does this for us. We can enter a series of data shots, and it will automatically calculate the best shot for us to use. We're going to enter our time as 1301.19 for our first site, and our first reading, which was 24 22.9 minutes. It then asks us for our second and our third site. We then tell it to combine the raw sites to make a single site. And it tells us which one is going to be the best shot. And this is the site that we will use for J. Henry to solve and give us our latitude and longitude, as we did in the previous program. One of the nice features of the J. Henry system is the ability of the computer to be able to automatically time your sextant shots. As you're taking your shot, when you match the horizon, you showed Mark to your buddy down at the nav table. He hits the enter key on the computer, and it automatically enters today's date and the exact time. You then just have to read out your sextant altitude and continue on with your next shot. The J. Henry program has many of the features that we've seen in PC Navigator including the ability to do DR calculations, a multi-year almanac, great circle routes, and in addition, compass calibration and the ability to plot your lines of position. The next program we're going to review is the PC Astro Navigator. To do this, we're going to use the laptop computer we took on our Virgin Islands trip this past fall. The PC Astro Navigator has the same basic features broken down into four different menu selections. Number one for your dead reckoning, number two for your celestial navigation, three for your multi-year nautical almanac, 
and four for your Twilight Planner and Astro Body Finder. One of the nice features of the PC Astro Navigator is its ability to be able to show us our lines of position. And we're going to show you that feature now. We've previously entered in three different star shots. So we're going to use those star shots and get a plot from them. We can see that the computer has plotted our three lines of position. And the intersection of these three lines creates a very small triangle. The size of this triangle gives us confidence in saying that we are somewhere in the middle of this triangle. Our lines of latitude and longitude are marked on the sides of the chart. And from these, we can see that we're at 34 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude, and 66 degrees, 32 and a half minutes west longitude. The circle indicates our DR position, and you can see how close we were with our DR relative to our triangle. We've now finished our job. We started out with a sextant. We entered the times and the sextant altitudes of the different shots. We've entered them in the computer. The computer has solved them, and the computer has plotted them, showing us where we are in the ocean. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that all three programs did a very nice job of solving the celestial triangle and giving us our latitude and longitude while we're at sea. Of the three, I found the Davis PC Astro Navigator to be the easiest to use and learn. Its graphing capabilities definitely are better than the other two. The PC Navigator gives you all of the basics and also allows you to work with your great circle route and your rum line prior to leaving the dock. Of the three, the J. Henry is the hardest to learn, but it has a very good manual. And once you've learned the program, it gives you a lot more options to work with. If you wish to teach yourself the manual method of celestial navigation, the tutorial is excellent. It is important to learn the manual method. You never know when these computer programs are going to fail on you, and you have to go back to the basics and do the form longhand. We found that the computers took a lot of the drudgery out of the work and made the celestial navigation a lot easier to use, therefore a lot more fun, and we did it a lot more often when we were at sea. When the snow flies in the United States, the southern hemisphere is the place to be. So in January, Sailing Quarterly traveled down under to Sydney, Australia to watch the Sydney Harbor 18-foot skiffs. Now these boats are about the same length as the Lightning, but they're half the weight. And where a Lightning carries about 500 square feet of sail area, these boats carry 1,600 feet of sail area, and they sail at speeds of 30 knots. The main job of the crew on these boats is to keep the things from cartwheeling. So if you want a real thrill, let's go. Lighter and no bigger than a dinghy, carrying sails nearly the size of a J-44, the 18s are the fastest monohulls on the water, reaching speeds of 30 knots, careening along a knife edge of hair-raising speed, balancing between ecstasy and disaster. In Sydney, we joined Julian Bethway, the 1991 18 foot skiff world champion, to find out more about these exciting boats. January is a big month, it's called the uh, Festival of Sydney. Starts New Year's Day, finishes normally on Australia Day. We've got the BOC in Sydney, we've got the 12 metre challenge, we've got the 18 footers, a lot of festivals going on in town, we have gay Mardi Gras. Good place to be this time of year. Today we will be sailing on the harbour in the company of the 12 metres, crewed by crews from all the uh, challenging countries for the America's Cup. Should be uh, fairly chaotic and interesting out there. Well, the 18s uh, initially started off as the lifeboats off the uh, square riggers that came into the harbour. About a hundred years ago, uh, a guy called Mark Foy had a race and uh, there were no rules. 
So what happened was these these lifeboats, 22, 24 feet long, put up ridiculous amounts of sail, and uh, yesterday was the 99th year of that race. The 18-footer is sort of evolving on a weekly basis into a faster, quicker piece of machinery. In a good wind, I mean, you just sort of average come down wind at sort of 25, 26 knots. If you're lucky and you can survive it, you know, you can probably touch 30, 35. Uh, how long you can sustain it for, who knows. The waterline length of the boat is 18 feet. The boat must be somewhere between 6 feet and 8 feet wide. That is the actual hull. There is then that maximum wing beam width of 16 feet. We actually now have a minimum hull weight. It's actually 82 kilos, which is very close to 200 pounds. And we have a maximum mast height now of about 36 feet. Upwind with the number one rig up, uh, Amy would probably carry 400, 450 square feet of main and jib area. The spinnaker would be very close to the 1,000 square foot point. There's no keel, there's nothing holding you upright. You sail these boats very flat. All the ballast, all the driving motion is from the crew out on the end of the wings. The centreboard weighs less than probably 12 pounds. Regularly you don't get enough time to pull the centreboard up going downwind. There's just not enough time to get a crew member in there to do it. Also, if you think about the boats going downwind, the apparent is still in front of the beam, so you need the centreboard down anyway. This is why we tack downwind. All the spinnakers are designed for basically shy reaching or very close reaching scenarios. Going upwind, the apparent wind's probably somewhere around 22, 23 degrees. Going downwind, the apparent wind only probably swings to maybe 45, 48 degrees. The only time it really gets behind you is in a jibe. They are, in fact, extremely complex pieces of machinery to design. Below hull speed, which is somewhere around six, six and a half knots, of course, they've got to be low drag, fairly slippery through the water. As soon as you hit your seven knots, the thing's sort of got to come up onto the plane in which case the nose is coming out of the water five or six feet. Then when you really do get hit by a scorcher and you do start going downwind at sort of 25, 30 knots, you need a, a boat which will track very true through the water because there's just no way the skipper is, is good enough to keep the thing on its feet. Uh, in these bigger boats, for all sorts of reasons, one of them being wanting to get further aft to keep the nose out, they build rudder frames on the back. It also allows control. So what is actually happening here is the rudder is being swung a good 18 inches off the back of the boat. That's just so that they can keep the boat in control at speed. You can imagine at 20 knots, the movement of the rudder five degrees will send you into spins. Um, so you have to be very careful to only move the tiller maybe a quarter to a half an inch but it's, you have to move it the right way at the right moment. <laughs> this is the uh, bow sprit off which we set the spinnaker. It is about 14 feet off the stem of the boat. The wires here are used to uh, stop the pole coming up. Of course, once this is rigged, it has those wires which we call kickers. These wires under our feet, which are called whiskers, which run out to the wingtips. Once it's there, it's there. So you're running around the harbour with a 14-foot uh, lance on the bow of the boat. Good fun. The bow sprit has become an extension of the boat, but the actual bow of the boat is back here. That's where the actual water is uh, started to be moved to keep the thing afloat. So your jib takeoff points can be anything up to 18 inches off the front of the boat. One of the biggest, most difficult tasks of being a crew on an 18-footer is actually selecting the rig. You have three rig options. Uh, your big rig is for light air, your medium rig is for medium air. You then have a small rig. Of course, once you've selected that rig, once you've put your number two rig in, say, that's it. Like, you only have one main, one jib, which are permanently up. You can't get them down, you can't reef them. There's no halyards in these boats. I mean, they're up there. They, the only way to get them down is cut them down. And a spinnaker. And you only carry one spinnaker. There's not enough room for two. So what happens is, you're sitting here on the beach, there's someone on the beach you want to beat. You're sort of watching them to see which rig they're going to put in. It's a bit of a game of chicken. At some stage, someone makes a commitment and then there's this mad panic to rush, rig the boats. So uh, you basically leave the beach with what you've got. It's part of the sail handling ethic. You know, quite often in Sydney Harbour, the wind will build. 
So quite often by the end of the race you are over canvas, substantially over canvas, but it's just a matter of getting it around the track and getting it back home again. When we actually rigged the boats, we set the, the mast bend for the day's conditions. But once we've done that setting on the beach, in the same way as once we've selected a rig on the beach, you can't change it once you're out there. That's it. What you go out there is what you do the race with. The rigs are extremely light. The whole boat is extremely light and you're carrying an awesome amount of sail area. The most innovative thing which is happening this year are the masts, which are 6,000 series alloy going up to high tensile fiberglass tips. So that as the gust hits, the upper mast drops backwards and therefore flattens the sail. If you flatten the sail by easing the main sheet, the sail flogs and you can very possibly drop the mast. So it's very important to get the spring rate of that fiberglass tip correct so that in fact as the gust hits, in fact you squeeze the main sheet on. Tightens the forestay, boat goes faster, mainsail blades out, very easy to simply tune the boat for the wind conditions, which are done with a Vang and a Cunningham control solely. There's no other controls on the boat. We're hoping that next year's 100th World Championship will probably have 30, 35 boats. They'll all be good boats and we'll have a, a quite a large diversity of uh, international crews. And we are certainly looking and would be keen on getting anyone from any overseas country who wants to come down here and have a go. So there's your invitation. If you race boats, yearn for adrenaline pumping through your veins, and have always wanted to joust, come down under and race the Sydney Harbour 18. issue we will discuss jibe prevention. An inadvertent jibe is both dangerous to both the rig and the crew. Therefore, whenever you're going downwind, you should rig some sort of a preventer to make sure you do not have an inadvertent jibe. This issue we will discuss three methods of jibe prevention. The first and simplest, taking your boom bang out to the rail cap tying it down to a pad eye and setting it up tight. The boom vang is taken out to a strong fitting by the rail cap and led down and forward. It operates as a boom vang and a preventer. Ideally, this bale should be out there so the boom vang leads outboard at a 45 degree angle. That makes the boom vang the most effective the least strain on the, on the hauling end of the boom vang and it eases the strain on the boom. But as long as your boom vang is led down and forward, it will act as a preventer. The boom vang can be attached to the boom via a purpose-made bale fastened onto the boom or you can just make a rope strop around the boom and snap the boom vang into that. We're unsnapping the boom vang so we can swing over onto the other drive. Each time you jibe, you have to re-rig your preventer. Another method of jibe prevention is rigging a preventer from the end of the main boom to the bow of the boat. Here we have a, a, a rope. You notice it is permanently secured to the end of the boom, secured on a bale with a light lashing line. Now what we'll do is disconnect the light lashing line and secure it to the pole four guy. The pole four guy is always permanently rigged. You clip the, main, the pole four guy into the main boom preventer. You take up on the four guy. And then we tie this little retrieving line right here. 
and you set that up tight and you can sail slightly by the lee and you still won't jibe. The blue line is rigged like a spinnaker pole or a whisker pole for a guy. It goes through a block out at the end of the bow of the boat or bowsprit and runs back down along the deck to where uh, you can secure it. The advantage of this system is you do not have to go too far forward as the four guys are permanently rigged. The second big advantage is you have a line going to the end of the main boom, yet you do not have to trim the main boom in to attach a line to the end of it, as trying to do this in heavy weather is a fine method of losing someone overside or having an inadvertent jibe, which is just what you're trying to prevent. When the time comes to jibe, of course, we've got to take this in. Slack the blue line, please. We take our preventer in and we secure it for driving. The third method is the Dutchman boom brake. A piece of equipment that has been around for about 10 years, mainly used in the single-handed races. Now it has come on the market and the American scene for the cruising man. It is an excellent piece of equipment which keeps the boom under control at all times. It's attached to the deck goes three turns around the groove shiv, down to the, a block on the deck, and back to a winch. And by adjusting the tension on the line, you create the braking effect, which can change it from being a good, strong preventer to just a slower down of the jibe. You'll notice that we safely jibe the boat without touching the main sheet, which is something you could not do if you did not have the Dutchman boom brake. All three systems work. You have to figure out which system works best for you, your boat, and the weather conditions your boat is likely to encounter. Today we're going to look at the brand new sleek cruiser racer, the first 45 F5. Designed by Bruce Farr, built by Beneteau, and with an interior design by Fina Farina of Ferrari automobile fame, the boat has some wonderful features which we're going to take you aboard and show you. The deck layout is very sleek and very clean. The boat comes with a fin keel and a spade rudder and an optional winged keel and it has a wide, clean transom, which means it will have very good boat speed off-wind. One of the innovative features you found on this boat is developed directly from the single-handed offshore racing fleet. It's the recessed roller furling head stay. This has a large Goyo windlass, a standard windlass. There's plenty of room for anchor chain and access to the roller furling drum. There's a door aid vent is set under the combing the handrails recessed into the deck. The halyards and deck lines run under the combing to the turning blocks set under this access panel. They run back into the cockpit. Along the center of the boat are the deck lights, which give you plenty of light to the inside of the boat. Below decks, the innovation continues. The curved steps set into aluminum frames, very sleek and very modern. The curved doors and notice the ventilation over the top of the door and below the doors. The nice curved trim of the chart table which carries smoothly right into the oval dining area. The salon has a gimbal table which can be set in any one of two or three positions depending on which tack you're on. It also has a large condiment well in the middle of the table. Across the other side of the boat, in contrast to many boats, the galley runs down the entire side of the hull this gives a very open, very clean look to the boat. At the aft end of the galley are a pair of ice boxes with stainless steel lined. There's a three burner stove with an oven. Forward of the stove is a, a marble countertop with twin sinks set into it. Under the sinks is a plenty of storage for your fruit and vegetables. There's storage here for pots and pans. Plus there's plenty of natural light in the galley. Notice the ports 
in the hull, the ports in this cabin side, which can be screened off if the sun gets too strong for you. And the natural light is continued with the deck prism running down the center line of the cabin top. Beneteau offer many different interior layouts. This one has twin aft cabins, a head to port, and a forward, double forward stateroom, which we'll go take a look at. This stateroom has a large double berth, has a settee to port, a hanging locker just aft of it. Forward of the stateroom is your own private head with a shower and plenty of storage space. Under the berth you have a couple of very large drawers for stowing plenty of clothing in there. You also have stowage above the berth in these small lockers here for your valuables and your books. The hull is lined out under the berth with nice white leather. The joiner work in the forward cabin is cherry. There is a mahogany option available. There's also two single berths available as an option for this cabin. Among the innovative features to be found on the boat are the non-rattling door latches, which provide pressure both directions so the door is, is held tightly in the jam. And now we've looked at the boat, let's go out sailing. We're motoring along now, the Perkins Prima 50 engine, doing about six, five and a half to six knots at 2,000 RPM. Fine day on the Chesapeake Bay. White cap showing. Wind about force three to four. Boat's moving comfortably. Got a half a spoke of helm on. We have a about a 130 jib and a full main at this point. Wind is about 24 knots. Boat speed is seven and a half, eight. We've got about 10 to 12 degrees of heel, and the wind angle is right on the beam, 90 degrees. Very easy to control. The wheel is very light. I think that would be prudent to put the reef in. Coming up a little more. We're sailing with one reef in the main and the 130 Genoa. And the wind wind speed is about 17 to 20 knots. Disgusting, shifting around a lot. So we're changing heel angle quite considerably. What I'm finding is that the, even with the big beamy stern, the boat doesn't want to pull the rudder out of the water and lose control when we heel. We get over to where the rail gets almost under on the leeward side, and the boat is still very controllable, very easy to manage, even in 18 to 20 knots of breeze. It's a very spacious cockpit. Four of us can easily tack the boat. Probably could be tacked by two people if you were so short-handed. The primary winches are at the forward end of the cockpit. Secondary winches are all the way at the aft end of the cockpit with the halyard winches on the aft end of the coach roof and a bank of lock-offs just situated slightly in front of them. The cockpit is T-shaped with a 48-inch wheel and even with that size wheel it's very easy for the helmsman to step around it. The cockpit sole is sloped up on both sides so that when the boat is heeled it's uh, very easy to stand. There's plenty of storage space in the cockpit. Large lockers, port and starboard. And on the, under the helmsman seat there's more storage space all the way down to the hull on either side. The emergency steering is in the middle of the helmsman seat which has a slight upward curvature to make it nice to sit on. Not only is there a swimming platform set in the transom, but there are holes on the port and starboard side for the man overboard pole. I hope you've enjoyed sailing the first 45 F5 as much as I have. And if you're in the market for a, an innovative cruising boat, then this is one you should look at. Well, that's it for this issue of Sailing Quarterly. Next time, we'll give you some more information on the cup races 
and we're going to take a look at the new America's Cup class yacht world championship. Now this is the first time that this class of yacht is actually raced. We're going to see some electronic chart systems and plotters and we're going to hear from Don Street on mainsail flaking systems. So until next time, I'm Gary Jobson.